Well, my apologies. Uh, that is a very good point. Uh, we encourage uh, uh, tech folks to come uh, and participate in this hearing, and I know many will because it's a subject of great interest uh, to all of you. And uh, uh, we are also colliding with the State of the Union address tonight and a whole host of other things. So uh, you can uh, uh, stream it right in here while you're participating uh, in this great uh, forum as well, or you can come over there and probably stream this over there. But uh, either way, we don't want you to miss either one, and, uh, and our apologies for uh, having them both occur on the same day. Um, this is a, a, a great opportunity uh, to um, uh, hear from another great uh, tech leader, and uh, I'm very excited uh, about uh, this opportunity, and if I can pull up his bio, we'll all be better off still. Here we go. Okay, so Drew Houston uh, is an American internet entrepreneur who is best known for being the founder and CEO of Dropbox, an online backup and storage service. According to Forbes magazine, uh, he has done very well for himself. <laughs> I'll let him share that with you. Drew Houston has, was born in uh, Beaverton, Oregon. Uh, he attended the Acton Boxboro Regional High School. Uh, he later graduated with a degree in computer science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he was a member uh, of the Phi Delta Theta fraternity. It was there that he uh, uh, met uh, Arash Ferdowski, who would later go on to become the co-founder and CTO of Dropbox with him. Uh, he was named one of the pr uh, promising players, age 30 and under, by Business Week, and Dropbox has been touted as Y Combinator's most successful investment to date. Drew was also named among the top 30 under 30 entrepreneurs by Inc.com, and Dropbox has been called one of the 20 best startups in Sil of Silicon Valley. Uh, in June of 2013, MIT invited, invited Houston to serve as speaker at its annual commencement ceremonies. In his remarks, Houston gave this advice. They say that you're the average of five people you spend the most time with. Think about that for a minute. Who would be in your circle of five? I have some good news. MIT is one of the best places in the world to start building that circle. If I hadn't come here, I wouldn't have met Adam, I wouldn't have met my amazing co-founder Arash, and there would be no Dropbox. One thing I've learned is surrounding yourself with inspiring people is now just as important as being talented or working hard. Can you imagine if Michael Jordan hadn't been in the NBA, if his circle of five had been a bunch of guys in Italy? Your circle pushes you to be better uh, and uh, that, I think, uh, is uh, what we want to hear more about. So uh, please welcome Drew Houston. And we'll apologize since uh, those of you down that way can't uh, see us quite as well. Uh, but uh, Drew, have a seat and uh, uh, welcome. Thank you. It's and, good to be here. Uh, and uh, thanks for that uh, great word of advice that I saw uh, when I uh, looked you up. And uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, the thought that uh, the five people closest around you can really influence your future. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I was lucky. Again, as I said, it started uh, at MIT and then uh, at Dropbox and in the Bay Area. i um, been fortunate enough to have some really great people join the company. Um, and uh, have been fortunate enough to learn from a variety of, of entrepreneurs sort of who have built some amazing companies. And so uh, all of those people have certainly made me a lot better at what I do. Well, tell us about Dropbox. So, uh, so Dropbox is based, it's a, it's a free service. Um, basically what, what you do is you, it's an app you can put it on your computer, you put it on your phone. Um, it lets you have all of your stuff with you wherever you are. So all of your photos, all of your documents. Um, if you ever email yourself stuff, if you ever carry it on a thumb drive, if you ever like, God, I really should back up my computer, you never have to do any of those things. Um, and so it's really easy to use. Um, we just crossed 200 million users, and, and things have been growing like crazy. That's phenomenal. Uh, where do you think you're headed from here? Well, so we've, 
it, we're growing really quickly. So last year we had about 200 people. Now we're over 500. Um, and pr we'll probably just keep, you know, if things stay on pace, we'll continue doubling for the foreseeable future. And that's, uh, that's kind of how things work uh, with startups in the Valley. You bet. Uh, and uh, what are your biggest challenges that you're facing? Uh, is it scaling up, or are there some other things you're confronting I, I with the growth so. of this company? So, so mainly, what I spend the most time on is, is really recruiting. Um, so there's, there's kind of a war for talent uh, in the Bay Area, and I'm, I'm sure all around. Um, and uh, just all of the uh, challenges of, of, of scaling a company. And you know, we opened up a bunch of, a bunch of new offices last year, and just sort of all these things. Um, are going on all at the same time, and, and some of the things that are on our minds are, I'm sure, some of the subjects we'll cover today. You bet. And is this, uh, for this audience, I'd be interested to know, is this your first uh, uh, trip to D.C. on behalf of Dropbox? No, I was actually here uh, five or six weeks ago. To, uh, President Obama invited a bunch of tech leaders to, to come talk about, uh, among other things, healthcare.gov and um, some of the surveillance, or the NSA and surveillance. Um, uh, issues. So it was here not too long ago. Two uh, critical topics. And uh, how do you think the relationship between uh, uh, Washington, D.C. and the Congress and the executive branch and uh, what's going on in Silicon Valley uh, meshes? What's your reaction to? Uh, a lot of uh, companies that have grown like yours have and grown even larger, they have bigger and bigger presences here, not because I think they want to, but because they find a, of necessity they need to. Well, I, I think it's good um, that, uh, I mean, events like that where, where the president invites or, you know, or, to, or wants to have an, an open dialogue uh, are really helpful. Um, part of the interest for me and, and obviously for the other folks in the tech industry is, is a lot of the legislation, a lot of the decisions that get made here have a really big impact um, on our companies and, and what we're able to do. Um, Especially given the fact that uh, people might not realize this, but more than something like 70% of our users are outside the US. And so we have this whole uh, we have people to the far corners of the earth who are also affected um, by all of these decisions. You bet. Have you found you have to interact with governments in other countries too? Or is that just getting We have started? all the, it's pretty straightforward to date. I mean, we, our primary presence is really, is really here. Um, and. Uh, and we just opened up an office in Dublin last year. So recently, uh, and I'll start out with a, a very self-interested position, but a lot of people here are interested in that as well. Recently, the House passed a bill addressing the problem of patent trolls uh, called the Innovation Act. Yes. Uh, and I'm very pleased with that uh, passage through the House, very bipartisan, uh, uh, got uh, close to 300 votes for it. And uh, the uh, President of the United States issued a statement of uh, administration policy supporting the bill as reported out of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, have you faced uh, patent litigation by so-called uh, non-practicing <laughs> entities? Uh, we have. And first, I want to thank you for, for your leadership and your help on that. Um, this is an issue that affects uh, a lot of companies in tech and um, has a lot of adverse effects. And I mean, I'll give you, there's so many things that are ridiculous about it. Um, we've gotten, it's sort of a rite of passage. Um, we, we've gotten our first patent troll lawsuits, and um, <laughs> you can't even make this up. So we were sued uh, alongside Chipotle. <laughs> you know, our, uh, I mean, I don't, where do you even start? Um, <laughs> it wouldn't be one of the five companies you put in as the company's most yeah, influential. No, I mean, we, we, are, we are always keeping our, our our eyes on our, our friends and competitors over in the you know burrito aisle. Um, <laughs> so, but that, I, I think that you know, <laughs> I mean, there's so many things again that are that are kind of um, absurd about the situation. So it's it's really good to to be taking some steps in the right direction on on really um, removing this tax on uh, where uh, tax on innovation really, and not just an economic one, but it hurts uh, smaller companies maybe proportionally more. Because it's not just the number of dollars you spend on, on having to do all these um, activities to defend yourself. But in a, in a startup that's growing as, as quickly as ours, it really mind shares you know, and how many hours in the day are really your limited resource. Um, and so all the time, all the people we have to hire to defend these things, all the time our engineers have to spend on uh, you know, filing excess patents just for the sake of having them. 
um, are times that we're not making our product better. And uh, a company that's not even as far along the startup path as yours uh, could be completely wiped out. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty scary. It's a, it's a threat to ever getting the kind of venture capital that you need to, yeah. to get going. Um, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, in fact, you mentioned it a moment ago about surveillance, privacy, and the cloud as it relates to United States government surveillance activities. Uh, a lot of companies have experienced uh, difficulties with their customers and with other governments uh, as a result of this. Uh, uh, has uh, Dropbox uh, uh, experienced uh, difficulties with that in its business? Yeah, and, and all the internet companies have. Um, for our part, we weren't part of any of the programs um, you know that have been that have been covered but even so it really undermines this foundation of, of trust that people have with American internet companies like ours because again most it, in addition to the issues here in the US um, and the concern that Americans have um, people are even more up in arms outside the US uh, and again more than two-thirds of our users are not not here and so uh, I've been, when I've gone to Europe, um, I've spoken at conferences in, in Dublin and, and like journal, a journalist in Germany and they like just throw rocks at any, <laughs> they just like throw rocks at you. They're like, they, they are really upset about this um, and it just puts, uh, it's sad because it, it really kind of undermines our moral authority on these issues. Um, I mean, there's a lot I could say about it, but um, it, it certainly affects our business, and, and it's something where I think we could do a lot better. Well, a lot of those governments are engaged in intelligence gathering activities as well, but uh, the problem that I hear from a lot of companies, and maybe yours as well, is uh, you need to be able to tell your customers here and abroad you know, what it is uh, that uh, you're required to comply with but in terms of uh, government intelligence gathering, and that's pro prohibited. So yeah. uh, here's your opportunity to tell us uh, what you think uh, uh, you'd like to see happen here in D.C. on uh, these issues, and, and tell us what you told the president, if you can. Yeah. If it's not classified. Well, sure. Um, well, what I, I think it starts with more transparency, um, both the transparency in terms of what, what happens, um, you know, and, and then transparency uh, in terms of allowing Internet companies to disclose um, you know, just as a start, the magnitude of there's a number of these kinds of requests, the way we can uh, disclose a number of, for example, law enforcement requests, which have a lot of similarities. Um, I think that would go a long so way. So it's only a small percentage. Yeah, that would be tiny. helpful to be able to say, of all the 200 million customers you have, or a billion plus that Facebook has, we only got these uh, small number of requests. So the average right. person is not having their data yeah. sought by the government. And, and I think, you know, both in terms of Dropbox and, and just sort of me, sort of as an American, um, I think I found a lot of the things uh, alarming that, that have been revealed in the last year or so. Um, and so just more responsible, ma making more responsible trade-offs between security and privacy. So things like the bulk collection, um, obviously some of the, so, you know, the, the, the sort of access, uh, sort of uh, some of the things that happen with some other internet companies where they're actually like tapping in to their infrastructure, um, I think, are just a really scary thought for a lot of people. Uh, in a related area, but uh, on a different sort of uh, issue with regard to uh, privacy and data breaches, a uh, lot of problems with a number of retail uh, companies lately, like Target, Neiman Marcus, Michaels, uh, with very high profile data breaches. What measures does Dropbox employ to protect your customers' sensitive information? Your users. I mean, yeah, there, there's there's all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, I think it, you know it starts with uh, we do all kinds of technical measures to make sure that your data is always encrypted in transit. So then, when you whenever you send something from your phone or your computer to our servers, that's always encrypted. Uh, the way we store the data on our servers is encrypted, um, and then there are a number of other. If you if you run a business, we've put a lot more, we've created a lot more like administrative controls so you can see where, um, you know, where your data is stored, who's, where is it, where is it being shared, um, have a lot of sort of visibility and control over those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, the list goes on and on. We do, we do a lot of the same things that, uh, that the other big internet companies do 
to protect users' data, and, some, and in some cases have even higher standards because this is people's most important stuff. And, and that's really the heart of it, is you know, all my stuff is in Dropbox. Um, uh, we do everything we can to, to keep our users' stuff safe because, again, this is your most important information. Absolutely critical. So if Congress were to move forward with legislation addressing data theft, what advice would you uh, give us about uh, where we should start and what we should look to do? Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of different aspects to it, but um, even just the, um, sorry, so say disclosure in the event of something happening, having one standard instead of a patchwork of standards by state uh, is one improvement. Yeah, I think uh, over 40 states have different, it's all different conflicting yeah. uh, rules. That can be really complex when you have one data breach that sweeps uh, millions of uh, users' information uh, starting in one place would, yeah. would ha make some sense. Uh, from your point of view as a business leader, how is it important that Congress uh, pass immigration reform? You said you were having a competitive uh, environment yeah. there in Silicon Valley for talent. I know about that. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, this 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 deeply affects us, um, and it even goes back to the where to, to Dropbox's founding. Um, so my 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 co-founders, my co-founder Arash, um, his parents immigrated here from Iran, uh, and I just think about well, what if they couldn't come? Then there would be no Dropbox. Um, there, are, we have all our company is full of people who are either immigrants or, or the the children of immigrants, um, and sort of from a, from a Dropbox standpoint, we, we, we try to hire the best people from all over the world. And, and, and obviously, I think everybody in here agrees the situation is ridiculous, that we bring in the smartest people from everywhere, and we educate them, only to kick them out to go compete with us. I think that's crazy. We know that. Um, but you know, sort of separately, personally, I, I think also the, the, the broader issue is also important. It's not and you met these the, guys at MIT, I right? So yeah. they came uh, in many instances uh, to MIT to, to learn great things, and we don't want them to take it back to their home country or to another country that's importing talent and, and compete with us. Better to keep them here. Yeah, and, and we spend so much time recruiting the best people, and, and we were having a conversation earlier that uh, you know we have, we have a bunch of H1B, uh, or we, 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 have a bunch, we put out a bunch of applications, um, we know that not all of them are going to be accepted. Um, a lot of the people are kind of waiting on pins and needles, or we're going to have to turn them away to, you know, again, go compete with us. And do you think these uh, high-skilled uh, STEM graduates are creating jobs for Americans as well as the oh, oh, opportunities they create for themselves? Yeah. For sure. How many employees do you have? In we have 500. 550. Uh, and uh, a lot of that's generated by people whose talent uh, came from abroad and educated here and want to keep them here. That's right. Great. And then for smaller startups, uh, you started out with some of these guys right at the very beginning, right? Yeah. Um, so the bill we've passed through the House wants to make sure we have 10,000 uh, visas, uh, not just for the big companies and growing companies like yours that are looking for the talent, but to make sure that right out of school, if they say, I don't want to go to work for a big company, I want to start my own business, I want that person to be able to stay here too. Yeah, I, I think um, I feel really lucky that I, I got to grow up here, and, and it was sort of just a matter of circumstance. And, and you know, I'm sure most of the people in this room feel the same way. And at some point, um, we had some you know, parent, grandparent, ancestor who was allowed into the country. And I think that um, it, it's a fundamentally American thing. And, and, um, and I, think, I think the trade-offs we've chosen now don't make any sense. And we want to encourage more Americans to uh, get into STEM fields as well and uh, lead to this. 50% of my progeny uh, have, uh, uh, my son has uh, done very well in this field. But uh, Congresswoman Eshoo and I uh, were not only the co chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus, but we're also co chairs of the first ever Congressional Student App Competition that encourages high school students to develop apps. We've, for many, many years, have had an art competition. And we thought, well, we ought to do something to appeal to uh, folks who have. Uh, uh, an engineering bent as well. So I know you were involved in a recent initiative to encourage programming in schools, code.org. What would your message to young people be in general, and how can we spread that message? So, well, first, thank you for that. I think that's a really positive um, program and a, and, a, and a great message to send. Um, you know, I think about, I was lucky to learn programming at an early age. It, it's been one of the best experiences of my life. 
Um, and I think technology is proportionally becoming so much more important. And maybe where in the beginning, you know, you think about the dawn of the internet and the things like the web and search engines change how we find information. And then it was uh, the internet kind of totally, there was a total upheaval with commerce and now you could buy things online. And, um, but now the internet is affecting all these other industries. And so all these, whether it's like transportation or the hotel industry or even things like agriculture, education, these things that were formerly, you know, software is the last thing on these companies' minds. Now these are all becoming software companies. So I know, I know Travis from Uber was here last year. Um, they're revolutionizing how, uh, how people get around. Uh, companies like Airbnb are completely revolutionizing um, you know, just the, the housing market or, or where people stay. Um, it's really a superpower. You know, I think at coding, you can take something from nothing um, in a way that, that, that or in, in any unique way that um, I think should be a, just a fundamental thing that everybody should learn. Very good. Well, uh, these folks have been very patient with all my questions, and I'm sure they have uh, some as well. Uh, so uh, do we have a microphone somewhere? And right there, and we'll, we'll pass it around. Who's got a question? For Drew. Got one over here. Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. And uh, I'm one of the folks who got attracted Dropbox when it was free, but I very quickly needed more space, right? So now I'm one of your $100 a year customers and loving it. I, I, I said, you said it was a free service, but gosh, 500 employees, somebody's paying them. And uh, so I think it's a great model. And uh, you're in a good circle up there right now because uh, the guy to your right is sponsored legislation to make permanent a moratorium against local governments taxing those kind of monthly services like I pay to Dropbox or like I pay for internet access. And uh, Chairman Goodlatte's trying to get that bill moved this year because come November, all of your services, all of our internet access is subject to 15 to 20 percent local taxes, just like our telephone bills are today. So uh, make sure that you talk about that in Silicon Valley, and please thank Chairman Goodlatte for making that happen. We certainly appreciate that. Thank you, Steve. That was not a plant. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we will definitely work on uh, uh, making permanent the internet tax moratorium. Um, over here. Uh, thank you, Tim. Right, my back great, great work here. Uh, Alex Howard, um, I'm also a Dropbox user, though I've not paid yet. I keep moving stuff back and out when it gets to be <laughs> um, But it's extremely useful for, uh, for journalists, uh, obviously, um, and, uh, but poses some challenges, too. Uh, and some of those European journalists I know and uh, talk to about some of the things they're facing are always concerned about encryption and about how their data is being moved back and forth. And you mentioned 70% of your user base is outside of the U.S. How many of them are now using your tools to see where their data is being stored and then trying to take steps to make sure it's not within the, our borders? Well, in our case and, and also in the case of other popular services like Gmail or, or others, uh, we store all of the, all of our infrastructure is, is in the U.S. And so it's been that way um, since the beginning. But now that might need to change, right? Because now it, we've always had, you know, some customers in, say, Europe agitate that, like, look, we want you to store your, our data here because so that your government can't, like, look into it. And before we were able to say, like, that's ridiculous, you really shouldn't be worried about that different conversation now. Um, and so as we were investing hundreds of millions of dollars in data centers and infrastructure and so on, now our life just got a lot more difficult because we're going to be now, now we're, now we're thinking like, okay, do we have to go build our, those data centers, um, you know, and all those people that we hire, are those, are they going to be in Europe? Are they going to be all in if we do something there, then like Australia is going to want their data over there and Japan's going to want their data there. And, you know, are we going to have to have this really distributed and complicated and expensive infrastructure? And, and I think that's a massive economic loss to it's the It's not US. the vision of the cloud, is it? I mean, it's, just, it's crazy. Um, Clouds don't stay stationary over one. So, um, so certainly it's a concern for, for customers abroad, and, and it would be a big loss if, um, unless we find a, a kind of a, a better set of trade-offs. You bet.
Hi, my name is Louis from Voice of America. Um, I used to use Dropbox as well, but then there's Google Drive, uh, Apple, and all the other cloud service that offers more free space. And then now uh, some Chinese internet uh, companies are offering even more, like uh, Baidu offers two terabytes of free space, and then 360 offers 10 terabytes. So what do you think is Dropbox's uh, advantage, uh, um, like strength, of comparing to the other competitors? Well, I think, you know, we, we've always had competitors even back when we started in 2007. Um, and, uh, and I think one thing that people sort of m might not come to mind is that, you know, all this space is not created equal. Um, meaning the experience with a lot of these services tends to be pretty different. And, and if you ask um, why people use uh, Dropbox when there are all these other things out there, um, I think you know the kinds of comments we get back are that it's really simple and it just works and it and it doesn't matter what kind of device you use. That Dropbox supports all of them. It'll support your you know Mac or your Android phone or your iPad or Windows, whatever you have, um, and uh, and that the experience is is better. So, but that you know it's up to us to keep that that lead up. Good morning. We've heard a lot of different discussion this, oh, excuse me, I'm Betsy Broder. Um, trying to get the right balance between having a marketplace and a regulatory structure that encourages entrepreneurship and innovation while still providing protections for consumers and privacy. And I wonder from your perspective as someone who has been very much involved with starting up a company, whether you found some regulatory barriers inhibiting your growth or whether you think the balance is kind of hit just right. I think that part of things has been um, relatively straightforward. You know, the venture capital community and, and, and so on, they, they've created some pretty good norms for how, how to get a company built up. Um, and then some of the, relaxing some of the regula regulations, for example, around going public or um, some of these like shareholder numbers that would force you to go public and things like that, those limitations have been relaxed and Jobs Act, things like that. Um, so our, I think when, when, when we sort of rank our concerns, it really, I think sort of from a value standpoint, the, the um, you know, privacy and security things are the, are the most top of mind. And then things around IP and patents are, are just such a direct waste of, of resources. Um, so those, those would be the top couple issues. Hi, I'm Bob Farron from uh, Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, I'm interested in the debate that's going on between the internet is a free and open space and we need more libertarian principles. But I'm going to ask the question, what is the responsibility of a company like Dropbox if in fact some of your users were using it for nefarious purposes and how, how do you deal with that now and how do you think internet users should deal with that? Um, well, I think we have to deal with it the way every other internet company deals with it and um, you know we make it clear that all of our users have to abide by the laws and we're subject to, to US law and you know in the case of bad actors um, you know it, in terms of like law enforcement there's a whole one set of things that, that we do there's a way we handle that um, in terms of copyright there's a bunch of protections that that we offer to copyright holders um, this hasn't been that big of an issue, but we, we actually, if you read Dropbox's terms of service uh, or our privacy policy, we're, we're pretty proud of it. We, we try to spell everything out in plain English. Um, it's another way we really try to be worthy of, of all of our users' trust is, is try to be really transparent about, about each, each of those kinds of situations. Um, I have a question here in the corner. Hi, I'm Gary Harlan from Arlen Communications, and this is really not about what you've been talking about, but maybe your friends at the White House or your friends on Capitol Hill, a congressman, could look at this issue of the Internet of Things and how you're approaching that. Clearly, with a global connectivity to all kinds of billions and billions of devices that talk to each other, machine to machine talk, <coughs> presumably have some uh, interconnection with humans along the way. Uh, have you thought all about where this is going and, and how soon we might have any policy discussion about this Internet of Things issue? Well, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a discussion that has uh, uh, caught a lot of attention around the country and around the world, uh, and it's certainly something that the Congress, which uh, 
you know, we, we sometimes are a little bit behind the curve on these things, but uh, uh, we definitely need to have that discussion because basically all of uh, the interconnectivity of uh, devices and aspects of people's lives uh, raise all kinds of issues regarding freedom uh, and security, and we've got to make sure that uh, we keep the Internet as free of regulation as we possibly can. Uh, but as was noted by a couple of other questioners, we also have to make sure that uh, we are still able to uh, assure people that the Internet is not the wild, wild west of the 21st century. So, uh, good question, and uh, we'll get on the stick. It reminds me of uh, uh, the, the story about my son uh, who uh, uh, went to work for Facebook. He now uh, works with a lot of startups out in California. And uh, when he was 14, Yahoo Internet Life named me the most internet-friendly member of Congress. And I was very proud of that. And I, I went home and I said, uh, I said, Bobby, Yahoo just named me the most internet-friendly member of Congress. And he looked at me without even batting an eye and said, gee, Dad, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do we have time for one more question? He said, if you're, you're, you're the most internet-friendly member of Congress, the Congress is a long way to go. Well, we've, we've come a long way in the last uh, decade or so, and we're very proud of the fact that uh, many more members of Congress now do utilize a lot of technology. But uh, the industry always stays ahead of us, and we're always struggling to catch up. Um, we have time for two more questions, perhaps? And by the way, that last question, um, today is um, uh, Data Privacy Day, so happy Data Privacy Day. All right. <laughs> um, John. Uh, John Stevenson, uh, your product has enabled a lot of people to move to the cloud, to do things from multiple devices. What do you think the next iteration of cloud computing is going to do for consumers and businesses uh, in terms of behaviors, new products, services, uh, just the way we socially interact? Well, I think we're still really early days. Um, I mean, obviously people know that mobile is a big deal, but I think they still underestimate the degree to which it's completely going to change how we work, how we play, how we do all of these everyday things. Um, for our part, you know, when we think about what people do with Dropbox, um, it's, it's what you'd expect. It's, it's a really easy way to share photos. It's a really easy way to collaborate at work. It's a really easy way to have all of your stuff, all of your notes, all of everything with you wherever you are. Um, and we just, uh, we think, we spend most of our time thinking about ways to make all of those things a lot better. So um, I think in, in terms of Dropbox, you're going to, the way you use Dropbox, what the experience is like um, in a couple of years or next year will be, or maybe even this year, will be pretty different from how people use it today. Thank you. My name is uh, John Smith. I'm with examiner.com. And um, the Commerce Secretary spoke earlier saying that there are more than 6 million technology jobs in the U.S. And I wanted to ask you what role you think technology can play in creating jobs in America. And do you think technology can also play a bigger role in helping to end extreme poverty in the developing world? Thank you. Yeah, I, I think fundamentally, like, technology is something that can turn scarcity into abundance, right? You, you think about the phones that we carry in our pockets, um, they're more powerful than what the president had, you know, not too long ago. Um, or, and, and so I think there's a tremendous equalizing um, effect that is really amazing. And, and, and I think for our part, we're, we're sort of are just in awe that, you know, a couple people, a couple engineers with an idea can find themselves five years later reaching, you know, millions and millions and millions of people and completely changing how people do, do things. Um, and then in terms of creating jobs, I mean, so certainly uh, for every, every engine, we have a lot of engineers in the company, but for every engineer or designer or product person, uh, for every two of them, we have maybe three people who are in other functions. Um, and so uh, building the, pro the product is what makes that possible, but, um, you know, you, when you look at how we've grown or, or how, you know, a company like Google or Facebook or Twitter have grown, they have huge ecosystems um, that have built and, you know, and have created a whole lot of jobs around them. Um, and, and we hope to do the same thing as, as we continue to you know, hire hundreds and soon thousands of people. Just one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Megan Gray, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the US government's case against Mega Upload and Kim Dantcom. Should I go first? Um, it, it, well, I don't, I mean, I think, 
I'm not super like I, I'm I'm obviously familiar with with um, with the site. Uh, I don't know if I have a whole lot to add about what's been what already has been covered. Um, I, I think it's important to to um, play by the rules with copyright. Um, and um, you know I. I, I think it's probably a better question for them to the degree to which they've done that. Um, but um, I think Kim.com, who's the founder of that as a character, is like totally fascinating. Um, <laughs> he's got he's got like he 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 makes like you know dance music. He's got like a compound in New Zealand. He's got this. I mean, it's it's crazy. If you, if you just search for Kim.com on YouTube, and you will be endlessly entertained. Uh, I agree with you on both points. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've uh, uh, seen the 60 minute story about him <laughs> and so on. It's fascinating, but it also is very troubling that uh, an individual could uh, 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 benefit the way he has from other people's intellectual property rights. So we really have to find a way that the, the tech uh, community and the creative content community, which more and more are merging in a lot of different ways in business deals and enterprises and, and so on. But we really have to find a way to make sure that underlying all of that is the, the recognition that people who are creative, whether they're creating a new uh, device uh, or, or app uh, that's used uh, technologically or whether they're creating something that's really artistically great and beautiful, either way, we need to make sure that they get rewarded for their creativity. That's got to be our bottom line. Yeah. Completely agree. All right. Thank you, folks. Uh, this was, let's give Drew a round of applause uh, for a great uh, discussion. <laughs>